Welcome to the Fundamental Baptist Podcast. There are many types of Baptists, but being a Baptist once meant that you were a fundamentalist. Over the years, many Baptists have strayed from the fundamentals and thus attack those who remain true to the faith. This podcast will address the issues surrounding what it means to be a fundamental Baptist. Somebody said, Brother House, fundamentalists are changing, aren't they? No, fundamentalists don't change. Folks quit being fundamentalists. God says when the troubles come, he said, fight. You can't fight. He said, withstand. You can't withstand. He said, stand. What does it mean to stand? He said, don't change. What? Don't change what? Number one, don't change what you believe. Here we will reason concerning the scriptures about the doctrines we hold dear. We believe in souls being saved, lives being changed, and Bible doctrines being strengthened by the Word of God. We believe in the local church, soul winning, missions, and everything taught in the King James Bible. I thank God tonight for this wonderful Bible. You know, I I thank God it's a perfect book, and I, I love the Bible. Doesn't need any addition, no correction, nothing taken from it. Thank God tonight for the Holy Bible. I like it just like it is. We are not ashamed of being fundamental Baptists, and we want to encourage others to remain true to the Bible, their Baptist heritage, and to not change what they have been given. You just stick with the book. You can't beat this book. Why does every generation feel that we got to change it just a little bit because our daddy did it fast with and our granddaddy did it like that, and let's change it just a little bit. You change it, and things that are different are not the same. The same commit thou to faithful men. Thank you for joining us in our discussion of what it means to be a fundamental Baptist. Hello and welcome. Welcome to the Fundamental Baptist Podcast. My name is David Baker. I have the privilege of being your host. I pastor the Family Baptist Church in Columbia, Tennessee, Vice President of Independent Baptist Online College, um, husband to Laura uh, Middleton uh, Baker, and uh, dad to 11, uh, papa to 11, and those are the important ones. So um, you saw the lesson there. Um, I met one pastor, well-known pastor, uh, a few months ago, and he said, what are you doing here? I was at a conference. He goes, you don't have time to be at a conference don't you have some controversial podcast to do (laughs) so controversial what do you mean so uh, if you see the title of this and to some people this is controversial Um, but I think it's good to talk about the topics and issues and if I get something wrong let me know email me Um, I uh, heard I've seen this for the last few years uh, by a group of people trying to put down Israel and Israel's not God's chosen and I have not listened to everything that they have um, taught and uh, if if there's a more out there you want me to comment on, feel free. You can email it to me, um, the Fundamental Baptist Podcast at gmail.com. But I've seen that, and I've had a few people ask me to uh, teach on it. So, okay, that's just quick. I'll just do a short one on this and we start getting into it. There really is a lot of information there. And so um, let, me, um, let me give you the purpose of what they are saying, and we'll show you theirs and do our best to present it and then go through different perspectives that most people have, and then show you what the Bible says, okay? So uh, hope that will be helpful. So the statement is being said is that today, the children of Israel, are they still God's chosen people? And it said they are not because there are there were certain um, caveats or certain things they had to do for God to be their people. And uh, we'll read those verses to you. If you do this, 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 I'll be your people. If not, then I won't be. And so I Obviously, Israel is not doing right. They're not accepting Messiah. They are not um, the holy nation, and they're not the royal priesthood, and they're not following the Bible. They've not uh, believed in um, in Jesus, Messiah, Jehovah, God. They, they haven't believed that. And so they're not God's chosen people anymore. We shouldn't defer to them, and that's not a big deal. And the people in Israel are not Israelites. Um, they're not people that we should support and, and, um, and be for. So that's pretty much the gist of that. And uh, uh, and there's a point to be made there. I believe that's wrong, and uh, and I'll show you that. I'm not naming them. Some of the guys are good guys, and they believe some things really, really straight and well, and I appreciate them and honor them for that. And some things I believe that they're off on. I'm not trying to start fights, even though <laughs> uh, that might uh, this might do it. But anyway, here are the four different basic beliefs about 
um, the nation of Israel. Okay. Um, one is called a dispensationalist perspective. And, uh, I am a dispensationalist. That's one of the lessons people say, Hey, would you, would you do a lesson on that? And probably will sometime, by the way, if anyone's an expert on this, I wouldn't mind doing it with you. Uh, dispensationalism, ultra hyper dispensationalist, the difference and understanding all of that. Um, so, but dispensational perspective, it says this, dispensational Christians, particularly evangelical or fundamental circles, often emphasize the belief in a distinct plan for Israel and the Jewish people in God's overall timeline of redemption. Uh, they're... They interpret biblical prophecies, particularly in books like Daniel Revelation, as indicated a future restoration and fulfillment of promises made to Israel. This perspective often leads to a strong support for the modern state of Israel and views events in the Middle East through uh, a prophetic lens. Okay. By the way, I didn't write that <clears throat> when I just looked up all the different perspectives. That's what came up. So, hey, that's what I believe. Okay, so um, you can see where you are in this. I would be, under their definition, a dispensationalist uh, concerning Israel. Okay, next, covenant theology perspective. Covenant theologians may interpret a concept of Israel as God's chosen people more broadly, viewing it in, as encompassing all believers, both Jews and Gentiles, who are part of a new covenant established through Jesus Christ. Basic promises made to Israel in the Old Testament as ultimately fulfilled in Jesus with the church inheriting the blessings and responsibilities of God's chosen people. This perspective may downplay the significance of modern geopolitical Israel in favor of a more spiritual understanding of God's covenant people. Okay, There are people that believe that. I don't. Then, replacement theology perspective. Replacement theology, also known as super secessionism, is a controversial viewpoint that suggests that the Christian church has replaced Israel as the primary recipient of God's promises and blessings. Adherents to uh, replacement theology believe that the church fulfills the role as God's chosen people, that the promises made to Israel in the Old Testament are transferred to the Christian community. This perspective often leads to a diminished emphasis of the importance of modern Israel and biblical prophecy and may can uh, contribute to less support for the state of Israel and political and theological discussions. And then the last one, dual covenant theology perspective. Some Christian theologians, particularly within more liberal or interfaith oriented circles, advocate for a dual covenant theology, which suggests that God maintains separate covenants with both Israel and the church. According to this view, the Jews remain God's chosen people under the Abrahamic covenant, while Christians are recipients of salvation through Jesus Christ under the new covenant. This, this perspective tends to emphasize the unique relationship between God and the Jewish people without necessarily endorsing the political or nationalistic implications often associated with the other views. Okay, I would be even more that one than some of the other ones, but I believe that first one is right. Now, <clears throat> I I think it could be very like, I hope you listen to the whole thing. I think you'll find some things interesting in here, but it pretty much could be summarized just in Genesis 17. And there's a certain word, um, we'll get to it. So Genesis 17, verse one, when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am the almighty God walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face God, and God talked with him. As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham for a father of many nations have I made thee. Now, earlier there was a covenant, Genesis 12, given to Abraham, Abram, that he would be the father of a great nation. Okay. Now he's going to be the father of many nations, Abraham, instead of just Abram. Um, so the covenant was back then. And now there's a stronger one made father of many nations. Um, Verse six, and I will make thee exceedingly fruitful and will make nations of thee and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for, and here's a word, everlasting. Hmm. How long is that? Hey, if God gave you everlasting life, how long is that? Can you lose that? No. Hey, we believe in the eternal security of the believer. If God gave you everlasting life, then you have it forever. Amen. Okay, here it says, I've established a covenant between thee and between me and thee and thy seed after thee in the generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Hmm. 
That's when I close the book and say, okay, I'm done. I got it. Thanks, Everlasting. I don't leave, okay? I, get, I guarantee you, there'll be some interesting things. We're going to talk about the Bilderbergers and the Rockefellers and the Club of Rome. Ooh, okay. <laughs> Does that intrigue you? Um, so, um, so it was going to be this covenant, this everlasting covenant. When it's everlasting, it's forever. Wait, wait, wait. But God took it away? Yes, yes, yes. It was. There were some things that happened. We're going to go through that, okay? Um, but that's what it is, everlasting covenant, okay? Um, Genesis 17, 13, uh, talking about circumcision, um, it shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. Verse 19, um, Sarah shall bear thee a son, indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him, okay? It's an everlasting covenant, all right? Now, there are times with that generation when God will test them. They don't do right. God pulls away. They cry into God, and God comes back and helps them, and then they get away from God, and God judges them, and they cry into God again, and God helps them. Have you ever read that in the Bible? Where do you get to that? Okay, um, so there are some ifs, some caveats. Okay, if you diss, then I'll then I'll be with you. But that didn't change the everlasting covenant. That changed for them in that day in that generation. You got that? Let me read it to you. Genesis or Exodus nineteen. Okay, so we're in Exodus now. The children of Israel here. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words with that which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Okay, there's an if in that one. Was there an if in Abraham's? No. And God gave Abraham a covenant. What kind? An everlasting covenant, mentioned three, four, five times, everlasting covenant. Now, in Exodus, these people here, if you want me to bless you and help you and do great things for you at this time right here, then you have to obey my voice and keep my covenant, and then, then, then I'll do this, this, and this for you. That's a big if. Well, guess what? They didn't always do that. The Jews rebelled against God. And so they went into spiritual adultery later on, idolatry. And even the Bible says that God divorced him. We'll get into that in a minute. So this covenant that was given to them is everlasting. God said that. But there are times when they didn't do right and God pulled back his blessing from them. God often did that. Uh, Hebrews 8 9, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Absolutely. When they came to the place when they didn't regard God, then God didn't bless them and help them, and God even judged them. God even, we'll show you this, God built up nations strong enough to bring judgment on his people. Okay, God did that. God often did that. But it does not change the everlasting covenant that was given to Abraham. And we will show you that later on also. Okay. Um, and so, well, wait, God divorced Israel. He did. Okay. Uh, Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them uh, by the hand to bring them out. So God's going to make a new covenant with them. Um, but because these people didn't do right, but God didn't cast them off forever. And we'll see that often. So God often judged his people. And even, here we go, God killed them often. <laughs> okay. God killed his own people often when they didn't do right. Golden calf. Okay. Lord caused a plague um, because they worshiped the golden calf. Don't know how many people died then. Korah, um, those Levites with Korah caused a rebellion. Uh, numbers uh, 1649 mentioned 14,700 died in that plague. 14,700 died. And who did it? God did. God did. The complaining in the wilderness, Numbers 11. Um, God sent fire um, and people were killed in that time. The fiery serpents in uh, Numbers 21, uh, people killed by the fiery serpents. We don't know how many in all of these. The plague at Baal Peor, uh, Gen Numbers uh, 25 verse 9, 24,000 people died in that plague, okay? Because the Israelites engaged in sexual immorality and idolatry. So, they were God's chosen people, but they didn't do right, and God judged them often over and over and over. God even judged the children of Israel because of David. Remember, numbering the people, 2 Samuel 24, uh, the people died there, 70,000 men, 70,000 men. Like I said, God raised up other nations and made them powerful to judge his people, Jeremiah 25 verse 9, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, 
Nebuchadnezzar, the heathen from Persia? God called him my servant. How come? Because he is going to serve me to judge my people. God did that. And I will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and a hissing and perpetual desolation. God judged them. God brought judgment on them by their nations, by himself. God judged them. But over and over and over, God judged them and he brought them back. He judged them and he brought them back. Can I give you some homework? Would you go read something? Um, don't read the whole thing and I'd read too fast and you say, hey, I read too fast and then I'll miss something. Would you read Psalm 78 with jaw drop? Would you read how many times God blessed them and they got away from God and so God judged them and they cried to God and God answered and blessed them and they got away from God and God judged them and they cried to God and God helped them and then God blessed them over and over and over and over and over. Does that mean he's done with them forever? No, we see he's not done with them forever, okay? By the way, is God done with them forever now? No, we'll see. God's not done with them forever now. But wait, they've rejected Messiah and um, they're not God chosen and they're not holy and they're not a royal priesthood and they're not that. They're not right now, but guess what? They're going to be. They're going to be. Well, that's all Old Testament. <clears throat> you need to get to the New Testament. Um, let me just read a little bit of Psalm 78, okay? The wrath of God came upon them and slew the fattest of them and smote down the chosen men of Israel. For all this they sinned still and believed not for his wondrous works. Therefore their days did he consume in vanity and their years in trouble and he slew them. Then they sought after him. They returned and inquired early after God. And God remembered, and they remembered that God was their rock um, and the high God their redeemer um, and it goes on and on and on, back and forth, judgment, blessing, judgment, blessing, judgment, blessing. Read Psalm, you ready? You got it? 78, okay? Read Psalm 78 and um, be, able to, uh, be able to see that. Pretty amazing to see God over and over and over and over. I've read this in church before, use this as a sermon. It's like, wow, how many times will people get away from God and bring them back? Get away from God and bring them back, okay? I mentioned that God divorced him. Here we go, Jeremiah 3, verse 8. Uh, and I saw... For when all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Um, yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. Okay, so oh, there it is. God's done with Israel. He gave her a bill of divorcement. Um, you ever known anyone divorce someone and then they get back together? God said, you're not supposed to do that. Okay, guess what God did? God divorced them and then got back together, didn't he? Um, after being carried away to Babylon, what happened? Oh, God brought them back to Israel. Oh, back to Jerusalem. Uh, remember Ezra uh, rebuilding the temple? Remember Nehemiah rebuilding the wall? That was after Jeremiah, after the judgment, after God divorced them. Now he brought them back and rebuilt the temple and rebuilt the wall. Hmm. Who did that? God God, just like the example of Homer, um, God calls her, caused her to marry Homer, commits adultery, and then God um, brings it back. That's an example of, okay, the people went away from God, and God still loved them, and God brought them back, even though they were unfaithful. All right, that's still Old Testament. What about the New Testament? Okay, do you understand how much God loves Israel? How much Jesus loves Israel? It's one of my favorite verses, Luke 13, 34, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem which kill us the prophets and stone us them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen that gather her brood under her wings and ye would not. Here's Jesus physically on the earth. Does he love the people? Does he love Jerusalem? Does he want to gather them together? Absolutely he does. Where do you get that he cast them off? This is Jesus on the earth. Oh, they killed him and rejected him and uh, crucified him. Okay. <laughs> Was God done with him then? Here's Romans 10, 1, the apostle Paul, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Well, he uh, cast them off and went to the Gentiles. Yeah, they wouldn't listen. Was his heart still there? Yes. Did he still try to win them and help them? Yes, absolutely. That's his heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel. By the way, Apostle Paul did some great things for God, and his heart's desire was that Israel would be saved. But nope, you still haven't proved it. God's done. He's cast them off. They're done. They're not God's chosen people anymore. All right. Let's answer that specifically. Ready? Romans 11, verse 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? Oh, wow. 
here it is. Here, here, here's like what we're talking about. Are they God's chosen people still or did he cast them off? This is Romans 11. It's the Apostle Paul. It's after the crucifixion, after they destroyed and killed Jesus. Got it? Hath God cast away his people? God forbid. Huh, he didn't? For I also am an Israelite, the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God had not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Huh, wow. If you're saying God cast away his people and the children of Israel are not God's chosen anymore, I don't know what you do with that. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Why ye not what the scripture saith of, of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, the Lord... Uh, Lord, they have killed the prophets and dig down mine altars and I am left alone and they seek my life. And what shall the answer uh, of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men which have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so that at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. By the way, as for today, have most Jews accepted Jesus as their Messiah? No. Ha, is there a remnant that has? Absolutely. There's some wonderful Jewish people on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ, accepting him as their Messiah. They're completed Jews. They realize that Jesus is their Messiah. There's a remnant still today of God's chosen people, just like in Paul's day, just like in, Eli in Elijah's day. Okay, There's a remnant of people. The disciples were all Jews. Paul was a Jew. <laughs> okay, um, God hasn't cast them off. Romans 11 you read the whole chapter, let's get down, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. And I think that's what happens. The blindness, in part, has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentile be come in. Ooh, Israel's blind right now until what? The fullness of the Gentiles. When the fullness of the Gentiles, when the last Gentile gets saved, guess what's going to happen to Israel? The blinders are going to be off. They're going to realize and see in the middle of the tribulation period that who they thought was Messiah is Antichrist. When the Antichrist takes and sacrifices that female pig on the rebuilt altar, they're going to realize this is not our Messiah. They're going to flee and the Antichrist is going to try to destroy them. This is going to happen. This is the Bible. This is New Testament. This is Romans. They are blind now, but listen carefully. They are still God's chosen people. And they've been blinded now until the fullness of the Gentiles become. And so, listen, verse 26, and so all Israel shall be saved. How many? How many in Israel are going to be saved? Wow. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion a deliverer and shall turn away in godliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Wow. As concerning the gospel, there are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. Listen, the election, the Jews, they are beloved for the Father's sake. That's the context of Romans 11. Okay, it's talking about the Jews. Um, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. The context of that, that's the next verse. We use that for a lot of different ways, and that's fine. But the context of that is that for Israel, the election of God's chosen people. And one day, all Israel is going to be saved. Okay, if God is done with Israel, then why the prophecy, Ezekiel and Isaiah, to bring them back to the land? Why those prophecies? Why the prophecy of rebuilding the temple? I've been to Israel. I've been seen. I've seen what they have ready to go to put up that uh, third temple in Jerusalem. Amazing. Why the prophecy of the Messiah coming back and helping protecting Israel when all the nations are coming against them? If God has cast off Israel and they're not God's chosen people, then why do we have any of that? The gathering of the nations, uh, Isaiah 2, Micah 4, why do we have those prophecies of Israel that have not happened yet that are still coming if God is done? with Israel and they're not God's chosen people. Today, 2024, there's a remnant. There are thousands, more than 7,000, it was laid back in Elijah's day, over 7,000 Jews that are saved. There's a remnant of Jews that believe in their Messiah. It's a remnant. But one day, the blinders are going to come off and all of Israel is going to be saved. Okay? All of Israel prophesying. That's going to happen. What about Revelation? Look at Revelation 7 and Revelation 14. You can read those. 144,000, here's what it says, male Jewish virgin witnesses with the mark of God in their forehead. They're going to go around the world and preach the gospel to everybody. 144,000, 12,000 out of the 12 tribes. God's not done with Israel yet. God's not even done with the tribes. How are they going to do that? I don't know. <laughs> DNA, who knows? But God, they're going to know during that time which people are of what tribe. 
And they don't even know how to figure that out now. But God's going to have that. They're going to know. 12,000 out of the 12 tribes of Israel to make up the 144,000 male Jewish virgin witnesses with the mark of God on their forehead that are going to go around the world. Revelation 7, Revelation 14. Go read it. Huh. God's not done with Israel. Oh, no. God's not done with Israel. God's not done. The Yard's chosen people it is an everlasting covenant. Yes, there are times now in, in history, God said, okay, you don't do right. I'm not going to bless you. You're not going to do right. You're not going to be my people now. Um, but the next generation, guess what? He gives them another chance. And they don't serve back. Next generation, he gives them another chance. How come? Because they're his chosen people, and it's an everlasting covenant. And they're going to have another time to do that. So now what should we do? Psalm 122.6, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Genesis 12, 3, I think, I think it's still there. I will bless him that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. I believe that. So politically, what should we do today? Side with Israel over Hamas. Side with Israel over Hamas. Uh, the horrendous act that took place, maddening. If you watch any of those videos, if you read any of what happened, how they brutally murdered the people, the women, the pregnant women, the babies, put them in ovens, burned, fried, crazy, the rape, the, the incest. And they still have them today, some of them, um, that are in captivity. Some Americans still in captivity. Politically, side with Israel over Hamas. Hamas are wicked, vile uh, people. Everyone's a sinner, but what they did is just incomprehensible. Uh, the people yelling from the river to the sea, they want to totally wipe Israel off the face of the earth. Okay, that's what they want to do. Well, what about Revelation 2, uh, verse 9, that says, these people say they are Jews, but they are not. Okay, here's what we know. At the church of Smyrna, okay, in Asia Minor, the church of Smyrna, um, that said these things right, uh, the angel of the church of Smyrna write, these things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works, tribulation, poverty, thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not brothers, son of God of Satan. In the church at Smyrna, there were people who said they were Jews that are not and they're of the synagogue of Satan. Well, that's, that's talking about today. Prove that. Prove that. Revelation 3, the church of Philadelphia Say things that are holy. I know thy works. Verse number nine. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Okay. This is the church of Philadelphia. Well, these are all ages. Okay. If this is ages, and I'm not saying it's not, um, I think there's many things that could go along with them being ages, but the house was totally against them being ages. And, and a lot of people, you know, believe that they are, but if they're ages and listen, then the age of Smyrna, there were people who said they were Jews that are not. And the age of Philadelphia, there are people that say they're Jews that are not. And prove that to me, that's Israel today. Prove that, prove that from the Bible. Okay. Um, listen, the Jews in Israel are Jews. They speak Hebrew and have for thousands of years. Groups and pockets of Jews around the world kept their culture, kept their language together, and have come back to the land that was Israel. You know what? If that much happened and that much prophesied about, I'm going to go with, yeah, I think that's the real people. Now, if it's not, and a thousand years down the road, there's another group of people that come back, and those are the real Jews, okay, I'll take that chance that I was wrong. Um, but I think that God even exalted a Hitler and let him be strong enough to bring judgment on the Jews, to bring all the people to come back to Israel. That's all a part uh, of what God, oh, you, you believe uh, uh, Hitler was a servant of God? I wouldn't go that far and call it that way. When you look at Nebuchadnezzar, how many Jews did he kill? How many Jews did Nebuchadnezzar kill? Okay, read those stories. And God called him my servant. God brought judgment on the people. Sometimes God killed him himself. Sometimes God brought a nation to bring judgment on them. Could God have done that to fulfill the prophecy and get the people where they supposed to be? Well, what about the Rock of Rockefellers and the Bilderbergers and the Club of Rome and the Trilateral Commission and the Council of Foreign Relations and the Illuminati and the New World Order and the Masons? Okay, well, and they're Zionists and they got the flag of Moloch, not the, the Star of David. Okay. Um, you know, I believe there's probably a lot going on with them. Uh, there definitely is a new world order coming and a new world religion and a one world government coming. We know that's biblically coming. And, um, but to be able to throw all of Israel away because you think that those people are not the Jews, I'm sorry, 
I'm not doing that. It's an everlasting covenant. There are times when the people didn't do right and God took his blessing away. Then they cried to God and God came and blessed them again. There are multiple times like that. But the Jews, the nation of Israel, is in prophecy to the end. And I believe God is going to do that. So for me, I'm going to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I'm going to bless him that bless thee. Does that mean that uh, we ought to go to war with all the nations now? I don't think we need to do that. Shall we support Israel? Yes. Uh, What about our own border? Absolutely. I believe we ought to stop our own border. And I don't believe we ought to be giving money to all the nations around the world. I'd be okay if we gave money to no nations around the world except helped Israel when they needed it. I believe God will bless the United States because we are being a blessing and a help to Israel. You think about this. The judgment of the nations, I believe, okay, the judgment of the sheep and the goat nations. Go back and read Matthew 25. The judgment, that's still to come. That hasn't happened yet. The judgment of the nations, the nations that are going to go after the tribulation into the millennial reign, the thousand-year millennial reign, the sheep nations are the ones that helped Israel during their tough time. The ones that visited them and fed them and clothed them and took care of them. Matthew 25. Well, you think Israel's not important? You think Israel's not important still today and in the future? The nations that were friends and supported Israel during this time they're going to go through of of this horrible time um, when Israel's going to go through that, the nations that support them and help them, they get to go into the millennial reign in a human, physical, fleshly body. We'll be in a glorified body because we'll already be in heaven. Boy, tell me, is God still interested in Israel? Has God cast them off forever? Paul said no. The Bible said no. Israel has a whole lot still to do in the future and the history of this world. I think we should bless them, pray for them, and support them. All right, I'm done. What did I miss? (laughs) Okay. Brother Baker, you are an idiot. You're a fool. You don't know what you're talking about. All right, tell me, show me. Uh, then I miss it. I, I'm If I did, I'll be glad to go, oh, wow, I missed that. Um, but I think if we, you, <laughs> looked at the whole thing, go, okay, uh, I can't go along with all of Israel does. And yeah, sure. And they're sinners. Yep, sure they are. And I don't support them 100%. Nope. Uh, but to pray for them and support them because they are God's chosen and God does have a plan for them in the future, I think we should. I think we should. And just because there's some caveats where it says, if you don't do this and I'm not going to help and bless you right now, that does not mean God threw away the whole nation of Israel forever. Even after he divorced them, he took them back. All right. All right. There we go. If you got a question or a thought, or if I missed it, email me at the fundamental Baptist podcast at gmail.com. God bless you. See you on the next pod. Thank you for listening to the Fundamental Baptist Podcast. If you have any questions, you can email us at the Fundamental Baptist Podcast at gmail.com.